In today's video, I'm going to tell you why 40k is not designed as a competitive game and why that's okay. Now, in order to explain what I mean, I'm going to be discussing 40k terms as they relate to one of the most famous games of all, chess. The game of kings involves different unit types, and effectively every game is a mirror match where both players have equivalent armies. Now, all models in chess effectively have the same attack and defensive profiles, being slain when they are engaged in a single combat. Each model has a move characteristic and some special rules governing how they interact on the board. In terms of objective play, victory in chess relies on you taking down the enemy warlord, in this case, the king. Now, chess is an incredibly complex game with detailed and intricate strategies. But in essence, the basic rules could be written down on the back of a piece of paper and learned in an afternoon. So if we compare chess to 40k, we have a fairly simple rule set. Now, with this simple rule set, you'd imagine that the game must be pretty well balanced, right? Wrong. According to popular chess websites and tournaments, the player going first, who plays the white pieces, has an advantage of about 55% over their opponent. As chess players get better and better, this percentage increases. So while it doesn't make too much of a difference at casual play, for professional play it makes a huge difference who is going first. So a game as simple as chess already gives a significant advantage to the first player. It is inherently unbalanced. Here's where the fun begins. Let's now layer the insanity of Warhammer 40k on top of this simple rule set. Come with me into a world where chess becomes the world's most popular war game. In the most recent release from Chess Workshop, the preeminent manufacturer of chess pieces, they've decided that the metagame has gotten a little bit stale and want to shake things up a bit. As such, they announce the Leagues of Chess Tan Codex. The Chess Tan are essentially just another way of playing chess. They have 10 different pieces that they can select from, each of which has slightly different rules to what you'd see from a basic chess set. You have the Squat Pawn, which can only move one square every two turns, but can survive being hit twice in combat, all the way up to the Mobile Land Castle, which can survive four attacks in combat and can also shoot at enemies that are four squares away. In addition, each Chess Tan army can choose a sub-faction which completely changes the way that the army plays. One of these is focused on the land castles, providing them additional defensive bonuses. It's another focuses on close combat for those pawns, allowing them to fight multiple times or to hit harder with their attacks. Each of these pieces also has rules in the Leagues of Chess Tan Codex to be able to be armed with different pieces of war gear, which change the way that they interact on the board. In addition, the Chess Tan get access to additional stratagems, allowing them to move faster, hit harder, or to protect their king in vulnerable situations. Pretty soon, people realise that the leagues of Chess Tan are winning all the local tournaments. Even seasoned professionals are forced to admit that they're going to have to buy this new hotness in order to compete at the Grandmaster level. Now, Chess Workshop do understand a little bit about game balance, and as such, they've decided to introduce a points buy system into the game with the release of this codex. Anyone can clearly see that the moving land castle is a lot better than a regular castle, given that it can stay safe without having to engage other units, and also that it can take so much damage before being taken down. To make it fair, each piece is assigned a points value, and then armies are selected up to that required points value. However, as Chess Workshop are the only people who provide these points values, and also the only people who sell these new models and the codex, it does make it difficult for anything other than the Leagues of Chess Tan to dominate the metagame. So what we see is that mirror matches between Chess Tan players dominate the scene, and everyone else's armies are reduced to obscurity, even though they've spent a very long time painting up their pawns and bishops to make sure that they look lovely on the table. That is until the introduction of the next army, the World Beaters, whose special rule, pawns care not from whence the blood flows, allows them to attack twice in a sweeping motion, removing everyone else from the game and absolutely dominating the old chess tan players, who also happen to have received a nerf to their points, meaning they're not allowed to use their favourite stratagems or combos that they were previously used to. The only logical thing to do is to sell off your chess tan army and buy the new hotness. So, writing this little alternate history chess was a lot of fun, but there are serious points here to be made. Now, chess has remained pretty popular over the last couple of hundred years. 
This is because while it is inherently unbalanced in favour of the white player, in an average game with average players, you're not going to notice the difference too much. Most of us just don't have the brain power to think that far ahead to make an advantage. In order to counteract this swing in the highest levels of play, chess players will play best of three, five, seven, or even more matches in order to make sure that the white advantage does not overwhelm the skill of the individual players. Now for 40k, even in the biggest tournaments, players only get to play a couple of matches just due to the length of time it takes to set up the models and play a game. I'm also pretty sure that they don't play best of matches and they're only ever one match each, but let me know in the comments down below if I'm wrong on that. So even if 40k was chess, we're not doing the thing which is required in order to make sure the game is balanced by allowing the randomness of who gets to go first, who wins the initial coin flip, to determine the outcome of the entire game. But 40k is not chess, and there's a few reasons why. Firstly, Warhammer is a dice-based game. Almost everything in the game can be determined by dice rolls. That inherently introduces an element of randomness, meaning that, to use the chess analogy, you could decide to move a piece, and then they just decide not to move. Now the argument could be made that good generals make best advantage of their dice rolls and stratagems to minimise the risks that they're taking when rolling those dice. But just by the nature of it, whether you're the best general in the world, there's still always a chance that you could just completely miss your mega combos or things that you were wanting to do. Secondly, Warhammer uses measuring distances rather than a square-based system. This introduces near-infinite complexity to balancing movement, shooting and charge distances, let alone the fact that our human hands are about as precise at moving as a sledgehammer is at performing plastic surgery. The third issue is with line of sight and model size. With the modelling opportunities that come from Warhammer kits, there's a chance that even in a mirror match, players will not be playing with the same armies. Each player's pawn is not the same. Where one person's captain may hide behind a piece of terrain, the same model, with an uplifted sword modelled on, will be visible behind certain pieces of cover. Even more absurdly, you could have exactly the same models with the same poses, but just due to the rotation of the models, you could end up being seen through cover or not. Additionally, there is no chessboard for 40k, and while several tournament organisers do have a kind of recommended layout for what should be put on the table, you're never entirely sure what you're getting. The analogue nature of miniature war games makes them inherently unbalanceable. Attempting to take an unbalanceable game and layering on top of it with more and more complexity, with rules, FAQs, codexes, seasonal updates, points value increases, and the rest, makes it an essentially futile task to get a balanced game of Warhammer 40k. So what's the solution? Now you may think this is a lot of doom and gloom. Ollie, you might say, why do you play this game if all you do is complain about it? Well, I'm glad you asked. My view on this matter comes down to one fact. Warhammer is not a competitive game. It's a collaborative one. Now this might seem strange. What's the point in painting up all those little men and putting them on the table if you're not trying to win? Surely that's the aim of the game. To that, I'd say that in its earliest days, 40k had its roots in role-playing games. You were taking on the role of a general commanding a great army, witnessing the results of your commands, good or bad. Even looking to history, generals were not perfect dice-calculating automata. They were hot-headed, impetuous, and wanted to earn glory for themselves on the battlefield. Back in Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader, the first edition of the game, a Games Master was in place to ensure that neither player got too much of an advantage and that everyone was having fun. They could set up obstacles to keep the players in check, making sure that one player didn't end up on the receiving end of a battering in the first turn, making it pretty much pointless to continue playing the rest of the game. And this makes sense, an organic, analogue game like Warhammer 40k requires an organic, analogue person to step in to make sure that the game can be balanced for both players to have fun. So that's solution number one, bring in a games master. But I'd be the first to admit that this isn't a great solution. It's often difficult enough to plan a game of 40k, let alone having to get a third person in to come and referee the whole thing. Moreover, a bad GM can still make a bad game, as you're not guaranteed that you're going to have a good time if they are interpreting the rules differently to you, or if they're just giving more resources to one player than the other. So there's an easier second solution. It's to stop engaging with the metagame and the tournament analysis mode of Warhammer 40,000, and play the game in the manner in which I think it's meant to be played. The key is to engage with the narrative of the games that you're playing. Play games with unbalanced points and unbalanced objectives for each player. 
A hopelessly outnumbered Imperial Guard force holds the line desperately against wave after wave of Tyranids, seeing how long they can survive. An overconfident commander believes his fortress impregnable, yet he's unaware to the infiltrating Necrons whose tomb world he has stumbled across. There are so many more stories to be told than my 2,000 points of whatever army is meta at the moment stands on the opposite side of a table to your 2,000 points of whatever army is meta at the moment, and then they shoot at each other and whoever gets first turn just wins. And that's where I believe the fun in wargaming lies. Not in chasing the new hotness in order to win a tournament or to be the best general, but in coming up with those ways to play together to make sure everyone's having fun at the table. Now, this is an opinion piece, so do feel free to let me know how I'm wrong in the comments down below. One last tip that I would recommend for anyone who does play 40k on a regular basis is to remove the command point reroll stratagem. This stratagem introduced during the 8th edition of Warhammer 40k I think is responsible for quite a lot of the fun being taken out of the narrative of Warhammer. Everyone has a story of where they've rolled that big six to explode a tank in one hit, or where they've rolled a one when they desperately needed to roll anything else. Removing this is going to introduce a bit more randomness into your games, but it'll make your victories all the sweeter and your losses all the more crushing, but with you wanting to come back for more next time. Thanks so much for watching. I release new videos every Sunday here on YouTube, discussing a variety of topics like this, as well as painting, modeling, and playing games. If you did enjoy it, be sure to subscribe, but also like the video and let me know what you thought in the comments down below. In the meantime, my name has been Ollie, this has been my hobby, and I'm off to go pre-order the Leagues of Votan army box. What? I like space dwarves.